All right, welcome everyone. Uh, I'm Sharon Squassoni. I'm a research professor at the Institute for International Science and Technology Policy here at the Elliott School, George Washington University. It is my complete pleasure to welcome you today to, um, <clears throat> well, the first nuclear policy talk this semester. Uh, these nuclear policy talks have been uh, going on for more than 10 years. Um, and we always strive to bring top level experts uh, to talk about current nuclear policy issues. And today we have a really, really special treat because we have this star studded cast for you to talk about organizing for arms control. So um, because we have so many speakers, um, I'm gonna get out of the way very quickly. I'm going to just briefly introduce our speakers in the order in which they are going to speak. Um, but I also want to alert you, uh, one of the, one of the um, uh, triggers for this talk was an article that was co-authored by Ambassador Jim Goodby and David Coplow in the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists earlier this year. And the title was called, An Ambitious Arms Control Agenda Requires a New Organization Equal to the Task. At the end of this session, towards the end, we're gonna put a link to that article uh, in case you're interested in following up. So first off, uh, we have Ambassador Jim Goodby, who's been a fellow at Stanford University's Hoover Institution since 2007. Um, it would be impossible to kind of sing his praises highly enough. He has been in the arms control and diplomatic uh, business for decades upon decades, um, including um, working with former Secretary of State George Shultz on nuclear security issues, ambassador to Finland uh, as an atomic energy commission, um, basically from uh, the years of 1955 to 2000, and he has indeed been active since then uh, promoting the cause. Following Ambassador Jim Goodby, we will hear from David Coplow, who's a professor at the Georgetown University Law Center, and he was previously Deputy General Counsel for International Affairs at the Department of Defense, and um, a little spoiler alert, David Coplow was at the Arms Control and Disarmament Agency, as was I, as was uh, Ambassador Gallucci, I think, at the start of his career. Um, following uh, David Coplow, we're going to hear from Ambassador Bob Gallucci, who is Distinguished Professor in the Practice of Diplomacy at the Georgetown School of Foreign Service where he was previously Dean. You may also know him as the president of the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation. Um, Bob also has a long, uh, um, I can't say checkered career. No, <laughs> he, did, he did so many interesting things, including being the um, uh, deputy executive chairman of uh, UNSCOM, you know, the first time around in Iraq, uh, looking for weapons of um, mass destruction. Um, and uh, also as Assistant Secretary of State for Political Military Affairs. Um, following Bob, see this cast just gets better and better. We have the Honorable Rose Godmuller, who is an alumna of GW. We are very proud to call you our own. She is a lecturer at Stanford University's um, Freeman Spolye Institute for International Studies and CSAC um, from 2016 to 2019. She was um, the deputy, sorry, secretary general of NATO, uh, but also very importantly, uh, she negotiated, chief negotiator of the New START agreement and author of a book on that topic that just came out this year, which I highly recommend. Um, finally, last but not least, uh, Amy Wolf, who's a specialist in nuclear weapons policy at the Library of Congress, the Congressional Research Service, um, she is the go-to person when any senator or congressman, or congresswoman has a question about arms control. So um, thank you all for joining us. Uh, we're really totally pleased to have you. And I'm going to um, give the floor over to Ambassador Goodby, and I'm going to recommend that the rest of us mute our microphones so that uh, we can have the focus on him. So Ambassador Goodby. The floor is yours. 
Thank, thank you very, very much, Sharon. I appreciate uh, your setting this up for us because I agree it is a terribly important subject and largely ignored. Uh, I want to begin by telling a couple of stories. Uh, one story comes from the period 1961-63, when I was in fact among the first uh, State Department people to be transferred uh, to the Arms Control and Disarmament Agency. It was, it was new then. And my stories of that period are very, very favorable. Uh, to prove that, I want to refer to the June 10, 1963 speech from uh, uh, the American University commencement at that time, given by President Kennedy. Uh, he uh, made a quite famous peace speech, as people called it, and I recommend it to you. It's still worth rereading. I, I think it should be required reading, in fact, for most people. But at the end of it, there were two announcements that he made. Uh, one was that uh, he and Khrushchev and Macmillan, and then the Prime Minister of Great Britain, Khrushchev, of course, then the General Secretary of the Soviet Union, uh, had agreed on, a, quote, high level discussions, uh, which he said would begin shortly in Moscow, quote, looking towards early agreement on a comprehensive test ban treaty. Uh, and of course that led next month, in fact, in July, uh, to an agreement on the limited test ban treaty uh, under the leadership of Avery Harriman, who was the high level official that was designated send there. Uh, the product that came out of it uh, was essentially a limited test ban treaty draft uh, that had been written by the Arms Control and Disarmament Agency uh, and it had been submitted uh, in the conference in Geneva that was then negotiating uh, on the test ban treaty. And uh, I regard that as a huge success. The second issue was also, I think, an important uh, change uh, in our policy. Uh, and I'll read this to you. Uh, this is what Kennedy said at the end, and it's largely ignored now by historians. Quote, I now declare that the United States does not propose to conduct nuclear tests in the atmosphere so long as others do not, other states do not uh, do so. Uh, we will not be the first to resume, he summed up. Well, that prompted a speech in East Berlin by Khrushchev in which for the first time, the Soviet Union expressed an interest uh, in a limited test ban treaty. Uh, and uh, those two statements uh, were uh, put forward by the U.S. Arms Control and Disarmament Agency. Uh, and I make one important point to you. Uh, it was done over the objection of the Department of State in the case of the, uh, what we call the mission to Moscow. And the reason was that the State Department was at that point uh, convinced that there was probably no possibility that a test ban treaty could be negotiated uh, and in fact, what they wanted to do was begin the negotiation uh, of the nuclear non-proliferation treaty, which did emerge later on. So there was a legitimate difference of view about what ought to be done. The Arms Control Agency pursued the limited test ban treaty, comprehensive test ban treaty, uh, frankly, over the objection of the Department of State, uh, which tells me that there's a very useful purpose uh, for an arms control agency then and probably now. Uh, the second story comes from a, a later period, uh, 19, uh, 1983, 1985, uh, when I was head of a delegation in Stockholm that was part of the Conference on Security and Cooperation in Europe. And we were sent there to uh, negotiate agreements on confidence and security building measures and disarmament in Europe, which is the full title of the conference. Uh, well, uh, here again, there were differences of views, except this time it was the Office of the Secretary of Defense uh, that wanted nothing to do with this conference. Uh, and it was Secretary George Schultz who very much wanted it, uh, wanted to, to succeed. Uh, and uh, in both cases, uh, Kennedy was a supporter of the test ban firmly. Uh, and President Reagan was a supporter of an agreement on confidence building measures in Europe. Uh, so in this case, the odd man out was the Office of the Secretary of Defense, which took the view that we should not begin negotiations until something magical happened. They never said what it was, uh, but uh, at a certain time, 
um, George Schultz said to me to stay close to my Count Soviet counterpart, whose name was Oleg Dunevsky. Uh, and we finally agreed that I, after several attempts to reach an agreement on setting up working groups, which is a precursor for negotiations, uh, that I would go to Moscow uh, and would meet with him. And out of that agreement came an agreement in principle to begin negotiations. We set up the structure, in other words, for a series of working groups to begin work immediately. Uh, that uh, agreement was criticized, of course, by the Office of the Secretary of Defense. And to make a long story short, I was uh, the subject of a letter from Caspar uh, Weinberger saying that I had exceeded my instructions. And uh, of course, that was my reward for getting that kind of an agreement. Uh, very different uh, kinds of things going on at that time. Uh, the Arms Control and Disarmament Agency was essentially, I would not put it too bluntly, to say that it's a creature of the Office of the Secretary of Defense. Uh, and therefore, their role was essentially a negative one. So that's a story that tells you maybe it isn't such a good idea after all. Uh, the, key, the, the key thing to notice in both cases uh, is that the president got his way. President Reagan got his way. Uh, president Kennedy got his way. Uh, in one case, this, the uh, act uh, produced a very useful backup for the president, President Kennedy. Uh, and I would say in, in the latter case, the arms control agency produced a very good uh, backup for the Secretary of Defense, who was highly opposed to reaching any agreement at all. Uh, now, what does this tell you? Uh, we talked about the capture of a small agencies like an arms control and disarmament agency, always a problem. Uh, I'm not sure there's any solution to it. Uh, the essential thing is to know that in the, the White House, uh, there is a person that supports arms control. And if you have that, that then I think an, an arms control and disarmament agency can be extremely useful. Uh, if not, it at best can play a, a, a game that would be helpful, but not necessarily decisive. Uh, my final point in this, these brief remarks is that when Kennedy proposed uh, a, something about arms control, uh, he did so not to produce the arms control and disarmament agency that finally emerged in the legislation. He simply wanted to have what he called, I think the words were an arms control and disarmament institute. In other words, he wanted something that would be essentially a, a research organization. I think that idea ought to be reconsidered at this point in time. It seems to me the Congress might have an interest in it. Uh, we do, of course, have a U.S. Institute of Peace. Uh, I was a, a fellow there for some time, and it does not do the kind of thing I'm thinking about. I'm thinking about a research institute that can deal with things like cyber, highly technical things. Uh, I was the head of the group that designed the, in, the re- uh, uh, introduction of the arms control agency back into the State Department. Uh, and uh, one of the points we made is the utility of it might be that it would help the State Department to acquire a technical team that could deal effectively with arms control. I don't think that actually happened, uh, but uh, it's still, it's, it's a possibility. Uh, and I think the way to do it is probably through the establishment uh, of an arms control and disarmament research establishment staffed with high quality scientists, uh, people also that uh, understand the economics of the arms control and so forth. Again, that was the initial idea that Kennedy had. I think maybe it should be revisited now given the political environment we find ourselves in. So I will conclude with that. Thank you. Thank you so much already. Uh, well, also for staying within our time limit, but uh, you set the table for us. Um, and so now we'll turn to David Koppla. Uh, thank you, Sharon. And, and thank you for assembling this very interesting uh, and very timely discussion. I thought that for my contribution to this panel in the interest of being provocative, uh, I might stake out the bold or even extreme position that the best way to organize the US government for arms control is to create a new organization within the US government for arms control. And specifically, I'll advocate going back to the future to reestablish the old arms control and disarmament agency or something very much like it. But before I begin laying out the case in favor of 
returning to the arms control agency. Let me describe the premise or where I'm coming from in all this. My perspective is that in any international negotiation on arms control, there are really two negotiations occurring simultaneously. One, the more overt and prominent one, is the negotiation between the government of the United States and the governments of the other sovereign states that are participating in the discussions. The other negotiation, simultaneous embedded within that, is a negotiation inside the US government where the various affected agencies that have a stake and have expertise in the topic meet together to decide what positions the United States should take on the government to government plane. And both of those occur simultaneously. Between them, the international negotiation is oftentimes the more professional, the more businesslike, the more successful. And the participants, in fact, spend more of their time and accrue more of their headaches on the internal discussion inside the US government. My perspective is that in order to manage both of those more successfully, an entity like a renewed arms control and disarmament agency would be a big asset. Let me first describe what the arms control agency was and then present three rationales in favor of reconstituting it today. As has already been described by Jim and others, so, so the, the arms control and disarmament agency uh, generally referred to by its uh, initials, ACDA, pronounced ACTA. And I should say in full disclosure that uh, I, along with many of the other panelists today, am an alum of ACTA. It was my first job right out of law school many years ago. But I don't think that it is principally nostalgia that's animating my perspective or this discussion today. ACTA was a small independent agency created by statute uh, during the Kennedy administration. Uh, and it was the lead entity within the US government for the analysis, the development, the negotiation, and the implementation of the full array of arms control, disarmament, nonproliferation issues. ACTA was closely affiliated with the Department of State. Indeed, it was housed within the main State Department building, but it was statutorily independent. It operated from 1961 to 1999 when it was abolished or folded into the Department of State. From my perspective, the agency was terminated precisely because it was fulfilling its objective. It was accomplishing the mandate of uh, supporting the perspective of arms control as a component of national security. As, as Jim Goodby has already identified, the agency can claim a substantial share of the credit for the progress that was achieved during that period in arms control, the limited test ban treaty, the nuclear nonproliferation treaty, the SALT agreements. Uh, any success has a thousand parents, but ACTA deserves a lot of the credit for that, as well as the Chemical Weapons Treaty, the Biological Weapons Convention, and a number of other treaties of less uh, prominence, but still substantial significance. The Seabed Arms Control Treaty, the Environmental Modification Convention, the Convention on Certain Conventional Inhumane Weapons, um, a lot of that can, can be laid to act as credit. Of course, the agency did not always win, nor should it always win. And as Jim has described, there were periods, dark periods of the agency's history, when it was captured by forces appointed by the president who were generally opposed to the mandate of armed control, making the point that if the president and the president's inner circle are not interested in pursuing arms control, then no agency could possibly swim against that tide. With that background, let me identify three reasons why I think it would be timely and valuable to reconstitute ACTA or something very much like it today. The first is the symbolic or expressive value in declaring to the world and to ourselves that we take this issue very seriously. We being the US government, the American population, that we see arms control as being very important today and of increasing importance in the near future. It's a declaration that this is a priority for us and we need to spend more time and attention on this issue. And it's obvious that the world faces enormous challenges in the arms control realm. 
nuclear weapons still hang over our head. Chemical weapons have been used in Syria and as political assassinations. Uh, the COVID crisis reminds us of the importance of doing something uh, more about biological weapons. We have future or current challenges in uh, cyber realm, weapons in outer space, uh, autonomous weapons and artificial intelligence. Uh, all of that is on the agenda. And the sad fact is that we've not seen progress in arms control, nuclear or otherwise, since the New START Treaty in, uh, in 2011, indeed, in 2010. And indeed, we've seen in the intervening decade the disassembly of much of the infrastructure of arms control with the US withdrawal from the INF Treaty, the Open Skies Treaty, the uh, Joint Cooperative Agreement with Iran uh, and others. And some would say that arms control is in trouble these days, that, arms, that, that maybe we're at the end of arms control as we know it. But my perspective is that arms control has seen tough times before and has prevailed. And Jim has already cited us to the limited test ban treaty of 1963. It's important to remember that that came within less than a year after the Cuban Missile Crisis and hard on the heels of the construction of the Berlin Wall and the downing of Gary Powers U-2. Indeed, sometimes it's especially when international circumstances are hostile and dangerous that cooler heads recognize their, the importance of doing something meaningful about arms control, the shared responsibility in nudging the world in a safer direction. And I think a new act that could make that symbolic point uh, re-emphasizing the ongoing interest in arms control. So that's the first argument. Second argument is the value of a single mission agency in making sure that the perspective of arms control is presented at all levels of the US government across the board of the national security structure. The value of having a single point of contact, a director, a staff that are working on nothing but this issue all the time. In contrast, the big departments that share this mandate, the State Department, the Department of Defense, Department of Energy, and others, because of their broad mandates, will inevitably be pulled in multiple directions, and they will have to make internal compromises to work on these different issues. It's, it's no criticism of those agencies to say that they have to trade off multiple internal divisions in order to, uh, and, and cannot speak with one voice. The interagency process combining those perspectives inevitably results in compromise where no agency gets its, its way. It's more a, 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 a physics problem of the resolution of vectors. And that resolution will be affected if there is one agency single-mindedly pushing in a particular direction. And, and frankly, that's why I believe the opponents of the arms control agency fought so successful, so hard to kill it that they recognized that the agency was successful in promoting the arms control perspective, that it was influencing the national debates. It was ensuring that this perspective was not lost. I'm not saying that arms control should win every debate. Uh, arms control is a component of national security. It's not the whole story, but it should be present in all debates and, and should be uh, an, impor an important influence. And the, the recent uh, ongoing experience with the agreement between Australia, the United Kingdom, uh, and the United States on uh, supplying nuclear submarines to Australia provides, I think, a vivid illustration of the importance of injecting arms control at all levels, at all times. Uh, to my mind, when John Kerry said that Joe Biden did not know anything about this deal, that's just unconscionable. The, the, the U.S. government should ensure that the top leadership is acutely aware of the non-proliferation concerns in spreading greater reliance upon highly enriched uranium as a fuel for nuclear submarines. I'm not saying the deal shouldn't be made. I'm not saying that, 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 the, that Australia should not get these submarines, but the, the arms control interests should be made available to the top decision makers. And in fact, to reinforce that point, it's vivid that the national debate about this deal has focused exclusively on the nuclear power, nuclear, uh, nuclear fuel issue, and not noticed the equally important aspect that part of the transaction is going to be Australia acquiring long-range 
uh, land attack cruise missiles. And maybe that too should have should be permitted, but the leadership should know that that kind of dissemination of tomahawks has a big impact on the effort to control the proliferation of other kinds of missiles, and that this transaction poses a grave threat to the missile technology control regime as well. We don't know how much that was brought to the attention of the senior leaders, but it should have been, and if ACTA were still on the job, it would have been. Similarly, in the ongoing debates elsewhere in the government today, when the Department of Defense is crafting a new nuclear posture review, ACTA or a successor entity should be heard on the no first use aspects of that doctrine. ACTA should be heard on the debates about the space force and space weaponization. ACTA should be heard on the pre-negotiation of restraints on lethal autonomous weapons. So that's the second argument, the, the, the importance of injecting at all levels in the national security debates the perspective of arms control. Third and finally, the value of an arms control agency in sustaining a cadre of professionals who are devoting their careers to the challenges of, of arms control. Arms control requires a diverse set of skills that the big agencies have a hard time sustaining. The Department of State, for example, has a difficult time recruiting and retaining and promoting technical experts. Um, ACTA was able to sustain physicists, chemists, biologists, as well as economists and historians and computer experts in a way that the Department of State and others have a hard time doing. And an entity like ACTA would be able to keep them on the job for their entire careers. The, strat the personnel strategy in the Department of State, Department of Defense and elsewhere is rotation of personnel through different tours over their careers. And there's some benefit to that in developing well-rounded, broad experts. But there's also some benefit in sustaining the expertise and having people not have to rotate, having people who are able to stay with arms control as their career, if they so choose, the arms control agency would be able to, to, to manage that kind of sustained expertise, ensuring that the that there would be not only personal expertise, but institutional expertise and the ability to draw on lessons learned from one treaty to the next, from one implementation into the negotiation of the next, to, sit, to, to think across the different stovepipes to understand the commonalities in verification of different kinds of arms control implements. Uh, new emerging technologies always outstrip the ability of the diplomats to keep up, ACTA would have through the sustained career interests, uh, some capability of, of, uh, of, of, of avoiding that kind of problem. The last thing I want to read to you is a quotation from the original statute that created the Arms Control and Disarmament Agency. And it's uh, uh, interesting that it's almost precisely 60 years ago today. This law was passed, it was adopted September 26, 1961. And in defining the purpose of the Arms Control Agency, Congress stated, the formulation and implementation of the United States Arms Control and Disarmament Policy in a manner which will promote the national security can best be ensured by a central organization charged by statute with primary responsibility in this field. I think that was correct in 1961. I think it's correct today. Thank you. David, thank you so much for laying that out for us. Um, we're gonna hear next from Ambassador Bob Gallucci, who, who did both sides of it, <laughs> ACTA and the State Department. Bob, over to you. Sharon, thank you. Um, for those of you who follow baseball, it, it, Sharon could be considered a great manager uh, because baseball, as you know, the lineup is very important. And the lineup here is very important. And she figured right in the middle of this lineup between Goodby uh, and Coplow on one hand and Gunnar Miller and Wolf on the other hand, you as an audience need a break. And so I'm going to provide that break with a sort of a diversion from substance. Sharon also knows that I have been struggling to um, put down some thoughts about uh, 
deterrence theory these days, uh, and I have uh, struggled unsuccessfully <laughs> so far. Uh, but I want to suggest that um, the struggle is worthwhile because I'm not sure of much in all this, except the first thing I'm sure of is that we are in a heap of trouble. Um, and that, um, if you, uh, among the things I want to reference here as we talk about the subject, is not only the wonderful article that uh, Sharon will share with us at the end of this session uh, by two of our participants, but also suggest um, the book called The Button, um, uh, which, in which uh, many good points are made about the current situation and uh, at the strategic level with nuclear weapons, and that it is not the classic one. Um, Bill Perry says deterrence is good for many things, but you can't deter stupidity. And we are on the, on the, on the verge of a lot of stupidity. Um, another thing to recommend to you in addition to that book uh, is uh, the um, Daedalus volume that came out about a year or so ago. And almost every, or maybe indeed every piece in there is worth reading. But given our subject today, I'd particularly recommend Jim Timby's, where uh, his name is known, I suspect, to everybody who's involved in this uh, session today. And he has a very nice piece on suggesting on what direction we go to deal with the current problems as opposed to the classic problems, which go to surprise attack and other things such as that. So let me make as quickly as possible for points uh, that are, relate to my proposition that I begin with, that we are in a heap of trouble. The first one is that we are there for a variety of reasons. And the first one is choices that we have made, we, the United States of America, have made for our own strategic defense. One is to continue to pursue ballistic missile defense. And the second is um, CPGS, Conventional Prompt Global Strike, which is still out there as best I can tell. Both these things, the idea that we will someday figure out how to shoot down a sophisticated, robust ballistic missile attack on the United States, something we have not yet figured out how to do, but hope apparently in some quarters springs eternal. Whereas with our competitors, that is the one thing that would deny them deterrence and they are intent and I mean here Russia and China particularly, on making sure that doesn't happen. The second thing is the idea that we will be able to target their systems uh, without using nuclear weapons. That's uh, another major problem for deterrence as it has been understood for the last 60 or 70 years. Um, these two things are things we have decided to do as a matter of uh, security for us. Um, they profoundly deserve reconsideration, and I'll come back to that point. The second is that in responding to these initiatives of the United States, and I do believe that it is in large part a response to what we have done, the Russians, as I'm sure everybody, most everybody has noticed uh, the wonderful uh, press conference that uh, Putin had about two and a half years ago or so, which he introduced uh, Russian strategic systems, this magic torpedo that runs around and destroys with nuclear weapons, thermonuclear weapons, um, that which is on the west coast of the United States, the cruise missile that is not only nuclear powered but has nuclear warhead, the uh, ICBM launched hypersonic glide view, and, and more, it goes on and on. But in every case, what we're talking about as we are with the introduction of cyber into strategic calculations, with the introduction of ASAT in terms of our capability to warn and monitor, with the introduction of space assets into this, we are compressing time. And it is here, the reaction in the United States has been, at least in some quarters, a need for speed, that we need to constantly be able to launch under attack uh, indeed, launch on warning. And with these kinds of systems, cruise missiles that will come in from any vector, whatever, from this torpedo, 
all the the idea that we we must be able to have someone at the president's elbow with something called a football so he can launch in a matter of what will have to be a few minutes without consultation with anybody strategic nuclear war we have to think about what we are doing to ourselves here with systems we're introducing a response that requires a need for speed and we are driving ourselves towards the introduction of artificial intelligence into the decision to use nuclear weapons. If that doesn't scare you, I don't think you've been paying attention. So I think that is a, it's, it might sound like a technical point. It, I don't think is. I think it's a, it's a much more important than quote, merely a technical point. Third, I think in terms of what we decide as a matter of policy, we want to use nuclear weapons for and announce as a declaratory policy. The question is not just of first use, but first use for what? There's an argument for some for preserving first use, but the N NPRs have gone beyond that to talk about um, not simply that we want to have nuclear weapons as more than a matter of use for a deterrent or retaliation if necessary, but have added new things to the list for which the United States might reasonably use nuclear weapons, reasonably being in quotes. And they include a uh, strategic attack using conventional weapons, um, if it be a strategic attack that we can't be managed uh, without nuclear weapons. Um, extended deterrence. Extended deterrence doesn't absolutely have to require uh, the use of nuclear weapons, but we have so defined it by not taking it off the table. We never are explicit about this as a matter of policy, but it certainly leaves open that issue. We have at times talked about using nuclear weapons as a means of responding to attacks with chemical and biological weapons. Depends on the NPR at the moment. Um, all this, it seems to me, point us in the direction of uh, a need for a policy discussion about what nuclear weapons should be used for. And I would say finally here, the fourth point, is that the national debate of these things deserves to be robust. We just lost a deputy assistant secretary of defense, if I'm reading my news correctly. And um, the, this, Ms. Tamaro's um, function would have been to oversee um, the new uh, nuclear posture review. Uh, that review, it seems to me, uh, should reflect a robust consideration of what these weapons are for and what weapons we should have. I mean, the question about ICBMs, I think, should be on the table every time it comes up for discussion and whether the triad is desirable or not. The question of low yield nuclear weapons to match Russian low yield nuclear weapons as the only method of deterring Russian low yield nuclear weapons is a matter for discussion. It's a matter of policy, as is the question of pursuing robust ballistic missile defense, robust um, capabilities in conventional prompt global strike. Anyway, at the end of the day, it seems to me that those who have thought, and as, as uh, David just indicated, that there's some virtue to um, uh, the resurrection of an actor-like entity uh, seems to me not poorly thought out. I worry about simply a research capability that does not do policy in terms of policy prescription and turning that corner. Um, ACTA did that. Uh, it did it not only in questions of strategic nuclear policy, but in questions of nonproliferation, for example. So that, take the Kapos example, which I'm very sympathetic to, that if we're gonna be selling nuclear submarines, well, why don't we fuel them with low enriched uranium uh, the way the French do, rather than with high enriched uranium? So there, there, there are lots of issues um, that I think research would help with, but I think if it, there isn't a policy arm connected to that, I'm not sure the internal debate will be as robust as some of us might like to see it. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you. That was fabulous. Um, 
now we're on to Rose, who has had the most recent uh, experience in negotiating and uh, has had to juggle all of these priorities. So we're happy to hear from you. You are muted right now, so please unmute. Sharon. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you for this opportunity. Wow, Bob, that was a real tour de force. I, I can't beat that, but um, I would like to focus my remarks on um, the proposal that, that Jim and, and David have made. I uh, have interacted with them several times as they've been working on it. And, and prior to the publication in the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists, it was really an honor and a pleasure uh, to work with them uh, on this effort. Um, but going through uh, Bob Gallucci's uh, dire list, which he just rolled out, which of which uh, I'm mostly in agreement, my question to us all is, would resurrection of an arms control and disarmament-like agency help us with those problems? And I have to tell you in general terms, my answer to that is no, with regret because I was the um, official responsible for the act of transition uh, in 1992 was when we were preparing to come in uh, to the Clinton administration, I was responsible for the act of transition. And so I know, uh, I knew of course, as a, a RAND researcher of the value of ACTA, but then I learned uh, in a very organic way, the value of the organization, how it operated at the time, how it managed uh, really to make its presence known at the interagency table, despite the fact that it was uh, small but mighty in terms of uh, its heft compared to the Department of Defense in particular, but also in comparison to other government agencies. So I know the value of ACTA uh, from the inside out, and it was uh, clear to me, however, that the organization was already under siege. There was an attempt in the uh, transition, the Clinton administration transition to kill ACT at the time. And it was only the intervention of Vice President Gore uh, that prevented the organization from being, being killed during that period. And it was then several years later uh, as part of the price for the advice and consent to ratification of the Chemical Weapons Convention that uh, Madeleine Albright uh, essentially acquiesced to Jesse Helms' demand that the organization be folded into the State Department. Uh, those are my recollections of the historical details and the, my interlocutors, my colleagues on this panel can, can take uh, exception with them if, you, if they like, but, but that's how I remember it happened. But the key point I wanted to make, and I was there when it happened was, uh, ACTA was already well under siege by 1992 and, my, uh, and under siege by the Democrats at that point, uh, with many convinced uh, in President Clinton's administration that it was high time to fold ACTA's tent. So I do think climbing back uh, from that history would be, first of all, very difficult to do uh, without some uh, really uh, forceful institution building efforts uh, based upon an absolute uh, consensus within our political system that uh, the institution would fulfill a need, uh, an absolute need and an absolute requirement. And here I think is, is the basic difficulty because as we all know, there are those who are divided about uh, whether or not uh, the goals of an arms control and disarmament agency would be uh, a high priority national objective. So we would have to deal with, with uh, the longstanding uh, critics of arms control and nonproliferation policy who are out there. Really it's arms control that's the lightning rod, not so much nonproliferation policy, but nevertheless, that, uh, that uh, set of critics is, is uh, a hardy perennial in our governing system. And then also, I think that uh, just again, for the, the, um, those of us who are enthusiasts about pursuing uh, arms control objectives as a priority of our national policy, it would be a huge heavy lift and, uh, and take a lot of capital in order to, uh, to resurrect the, the organization. And I think we really do have to focus in on this question, would it help us to achieve our objectives as we look to the next phase of trying to negotiate restraint with regard to uh, weapons of mass destruction uh, in whatever form they may take. And with the new technologies, as Bob quite rightly points out, 
now supercharging the capabilities of already weapons that are capable of mass destruction. So I, um, I have my doubts uh, about this idea um, and that is uh, my honest opinion. I have served as the Undersecretary of State for Arms Control and International Security, uh, which is the successor to the active director and has some of the same responsibilities as the active director, but not all of them. The active director did have an independent seat at the interagency inter table uh, going before the president to fight out these issues. So there is some absolute value to that. But I'm wondering if there's not a way to think about heightening the existing capabilities in the interagency that deals with these issues. First of all, to make sure, to try to ensure that more gets injected uh, into uh, decision-making at the highest level. There is one thing though, David, I will comment with regard to the AUKUS deal. Um, if a deal is being kept really quiet, so that nobody around the government knows about it, which seems to have been the case in this case. An institution with a priority for handling the set of issues uh, would have been like everybody else playing catch up after the deal was announced. So uh, of course it would be important and it is important to have those views articulated inside government in criticism of, of the AUKUS deal, but in, in the run up to being rolled out when, um, everyone is gazumped by a new policy initiative, then um, there's nothing that an institution can do except to play catch up afterwards. But uh, a couple of points as we embark the debate during our discussion period, I'll be very interested to hear what Amy has to say as well. Um, there are some important points, I think, uh, that both Jim and David have stressed, and that is to really give force uh, to the symbolic uh, impressive value that this set of issues, arms control uh, and nonproliferation have in the US system, that they are a priority. And um, that is, I think, an important point. And it is something that was lost. And also there was a copycat effect. No sooner did we do away with the Arms Control and Disarmament Agency, than the Russian Federation removed the word disarmament from the directorship in the Ministry of Form Foreign Affairs that handles these issues. And it became, you know, a more amorphous kind of organization still handling these issues, but without that uh, focus as a priority in, in its very name. And so I think, you know, there has been some effect in the way I think internationally people think about whether or not this is a priority, whether or not it is a priority objective. Um, I also think that it is value to valuable to think about uh, the way the institution was able to sustain a cadre of professionals across uh, technical uh, arenas as well. I'm doing everything I can and, and I did as undersecretary to try to push technical capability and capacity in the T family. Uh, that includes not only the Arms Control Bureau, but also Nonproliferation Bureau and Political Military Affairs Bureau. But there were just limited uh, instruments in order to do so, limited hiring authorities. And uh, so David's absolutely right about that. But here I think again, is there a fix that we can consider now to renew or restore some hiring authorities uh, or create some hiring authorities so that we can, we can uh, remedy this problem for the T family of bureaus in the Department of State? They did uh, suffer a great deal of degradation during the previous administration and need to be strengthened again. That goes across the board for many parts of the Department of State. Uh, but I think we need to think about some solutions that are, uh, are not so all encompassing, I'll put it this way, as an attempt at creating uh, an institution or reconstituting an institution like the Arms Control and Disarmament Agency. So, with those remarks, again, I look forward to our discussion and debate. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rose. Um, <clears throat> last but not least, we have Amy Wolf to talk about uh, the congressional end of this. And then um, for the rest of the panelists, I think we have a little time. If you have questions or comments to each other, we can spend a couple minutes after uh, Amy's presentation. Okay, Amy, over to you. 
Thank you. Um, thank you for having me today. And of course, in Ambassador Gallucci's uh, reference, I guess this makes me the poor eighth person in the lineup who gets ignored by everyone because the pitcher's coming up and you may as well pitch to the pitcher. But anyway, it's a baseball day. Um, I was hoping Rose would say something today that she said in many of her presentations in previous uh, times over the last year or so. She's very confident that if you brief Congress and educate Congress about arms control, you can bring them around to voting in favor of treaties. And when I have had the opportunity, I have scoffed at that a bit. But it's not because I don't believe you can bring Congress around to vote for arms control treaties. I just don't think that the environment we're in right now is one that would prioritize objective analysis with Congress. And therefore, my goal this afternoon is to talk about whether or not reestablishing an agency like ACTA that could be a persistent and repetitive benefit to members of Congress if they were looking for information, could that help? And could that help both in advising Congress on specific issues, but keeping them engaged in arms control? And I'm gonna do that by looking both at where we are now and where we were when ACTA existed. But I wanna begin, I've got four key points, and I wanna begin with the first one that arms control is an episodic and sporadic issue for Congress. There are lots of episodes over the last 10 years, makes it seem kind of silly to say Congress isn't always paying attention to arms control, but we've had lots of episodes. The New START Treaty and its ratification debate, INF, the Open Skies Treaty, JCPOA, back to New START. These are episodes though. There's no continuous thread of arms control as a policy area. There's just episodes of arms control that come up before Congress. So, Members have built some muscle memory through this era of understanding what arms control is and how we use it. But the number of members who pay a lot of attention is very small. And it's not a high priority for their constituents, for their committee responsibilities, and they don't maintain staff expertise the way they did back in the era when arms control was more of an ongoing process. My second point, how does Congress engage in arms control as an issue rather than as a sporadic episodic event? First, there are the episodes. Congress has to respond when an agreement has been signed. The Senate has to give its advice and consent to ratification by a vote of two thirds of the members uh, who are present. And that requires, as Rose can attest to better than anyone else here at the moment, lots of meetings, lots of hearings, lots of briefings, lots of engagement. So it's intense engagement for a relatively short period of time. If it were an executive agreement or something like the JCPOA that goes to both chambers, it's the same sort of thing just across the street and across the aisle. And it's very intense, but that's episodic. Um, Congress can also hold oversight hearings on arms control or other cooperative, cooperative threat management techniques. And they did that regularly during the Cold War when ACTA existed in that every year there'd be a couple of hearings on both sides of the hill about arms control in general how are the negotiations going what other proposals do we have that was a regular feature but in the last 30 years not so much um i think maybe one or two hearings about each treaty when it enters into force until 2013. and then we started getting regular hearings again on the inf treaty on open skies on the jcpoa but again, episodic, dealing with each episode of arms control, not with arms control as an overarching issue. So how was it different when ACTA existed, my third point. Part of this has nothing to do with ACTA and everything to do with how arms control was a part of our national security strategy. It was more of a process than a series of episodes. We had ongoing negotiations in the international community. We had ongoing negotiations with the Soviet Union that were a process that occasionally produced an agreement rather than episodes of agreements that came out of negotiations. So we had ongoing arms control engagements and that allowed for ongoing arms control engagement on Capitol Hill. We had the oversight hearings and members and staff received briefings from administration officials far more regularly 
than they do now. I mean, now the briefings are few and far between unless we're in one of the episodes. So staff engagement in particular was more consistent. You could get a briefing with the director of ACTA or with a chief negotiator or with some team from state DOD and ACTA. All you had to do as a staffer was put it together. And I know Ed Levine's on the call, so he can either confirm this or laugh at me for saying this, but staff seemed more engaged in those days than they are now. And they, didn't, they had more resources devoted to arms control. The, you also had the authorization and appropriations process, which is your annual check through the budget and talk to the leadership from an agency uh, hearings in Congress. Now, state and DOD come up for their authorization and appropriations hearings every year. And I think if I had done a word search through the last 20 years of hearings in both the House and the Senate, the word arms control would be rare. When ACTA existed, it also had to come up to the Hill for authorization hearings. So that was yet another opportunity for members to hold a hearing dedicated to arms control as a policy rather than arms control as an episode. So would it help if ACTA existed now to re-engage members and staff and make arms control something that's more than just episodes? And what could they do that would change this? And I hate to say, I'm going to go along with Rose here that I don't think it would make that much of a difference because I don't think it's the organization as much as the way we engage with arms control. But a focused agency like ACTA could share its expertise with staff who are focused on the issue. Now it's possible, and Rose can either confirm or deny this, that the T-Bureau had many of these engagements with staffers, even when we weren't actually negotiating New START, and that it already happened. But when there was an ACTA, there were regular briefings to staff. How's the arms control negotiation going? You could sit in the room with the director of ACTA or the head of a negotiating team and pin them to the wall for a couple of hours, been there, done that, um, to get the details of what was going on. And I don't know that there's that level of consistent engagement now, in part because there isn't that kind of staffing at the T Bureau to do it, but also because there isn't that kind of staffing on the Hill. So if there were a dedicated agency, you might be able to build that up again. The problem is, and this I think is where the great downfall comes, is that the information ecosystem right now is much more crowded than it was during the Cold War. In those briefings, the executive branch was the primary source of information of what was going on in the arms control world for members of Congress. There were advocacy agencies, advocacy organizations, but those were the days where if you wanted a report that an agency or an organization had produced, you had to get on the Metro, go over to their office and pick it up, or they'd put it in the mail for you and it would arrive in a manila envelope a couple of weeks later. These days, every organization puts out a dozen reports a week, posts them on their website, and I download all of them. I do not read them all. Who has time? So the information ecosystem is quite overloaded. It's also bifurcated and partisan. So every agency organization think tank has all of these reports coming out and many of them are agenda driven the information is not always nonpartisan and unbiased sometimes it is trying to advocate for a particular point of view and that's true across the spectrum i'm not trying to denigrate anybody that's how it works so if you're on the hill and you're being just inundated with these reports and you do more than I do because I file them. Occasionally I read them. But if you're being inundated, you just don't know who to turn to. So you turn to those people you already trust. So the information ecosystem is overloaded and it's bifurcated. If you agree with a particular think tank on its education policy and you have questions about arms control and they put out a report on arms control, that's the one you will read. If you have an agency, an organization that you trust for immigration policy, and they put out a report on arms control, you'll read that one. Very few people have time to read across the spectrum. So the information ecosystem is both cluttering the debate with lots and lots of reports, and many of them are really useful, really helpful, and really informative. You just can't read them all. So for staffers who are trying to keep up with this issue, along with the seven other issues in their portfolio, it really is a case of information overload and give me the two or three talking points 
that I need to present to the boss. Having ACTA or something like it around might be able to help declutter the information ecosystem or maybe just another voice in that ecosystem, in which case it doesn't make things better. It may not make things worse, but I'm just not sure that in this day and age, when everybody can have their opinion line up equally amongst all the opinions, that ACTA plays that would play that much of a role. And I'll leave it with that. Thank you so much. Um, I see Ambassador Goodby's hand is up. So I'm guessing you wanna jump into the debate here. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Sharon. I wanted to uh, draw on our report, uh, that part of it, which said, well, if we can't get ACTA, there is a fallback. And that is to create something like a special assistant to the president for arms control and disarmament. Uh, I think we wrote about that at some length in our report, uh, pointing out the advantages and drawbacks. Uh, what uh, Amy said just now uh, seems to me to encourage the idea that the president should establish a special assistant. Uh, there would be somebody that could be called down to the Hill to discuss policies. There would be somebody who could make speeches about arms control. Uh, there would be somebody who could draw together in, in interagency group. Uh, you know, uh, I actually got into arms control in the Eisenhower administration when a man named Harold Stassen was a special assistant to the president. And I tell you, he did a very, very good job despite his subsequent uh, efforts to become a presidential nominee again. Uh, so I would recommend we give some thought to the idea of establishing a special assistant to the president for arms control and disarmament. I would recommend that we, as I think we say in our report, try to strengthen the scientific uh, advisor to the president uh, so that he has more of a staff of people who could actually sustain and support uh, the special assistant to the president. Uh, and uh, I would think that that's something we ought to think about and, and recommend. Uh, I would make one uh, additional thought, diff slightly different subject. Uh, Rob Gallucci mentioned uh, the uh, research agency that I had suggested. Uh, I'm thinking of something that is not completely untethered from policy. I'm thinking of something that's a federally funded agency as RAND was, for example, for the Air Force, still is, I suppose. Uh, and in this case, it would be a, an agency, a research group, federally funded, that would be at the beck and call, more or less, of the Secretary of State. Uh, so that would be a way of strengthening the technical component of the Department of State, which uh, despite Rose's best efforts, I think uh, still needs some additional strengthening in terms of the, of the technical component. So those are my two thoughts for you. Thank you. Thank you for that. That's fascinating, you know, because the what we call the FFRDCs, federally funded R&D centers, were all designed to support defense and designed to support the, you know, like RAND supports Air Force, logistics management supports the, and, and the services. So that's the first I've heard of, of a, of a FFRDC to support state. Um, I think that's fascinating. I think the, um, the, the one kind of comment I would have on the White House position is that it's, um, it's tough, you need the right person. And I think in, you know, I've seen people in the White House and the NSC staff who were able to very masterfully get people to do things, right? By sheer force of their personality and others who were completely hapless and, you know, were just drinking from the fire hose every day and, you know, couldn't, couldn't didn't really have a vision. The, the I, I think that's a definite, um, prerequisite though. Uh, but the, the, the value that I see in having an agency, whether, and I, I personally, um, don't promote, you know, the idea of resurrecting ACTA, um, because I think the disarmament part, you know, disarmament has become a dirty word in our, in our government, even though it's, it's become much more popular around the world. Um, but, the virtue in having a separate agency is having that budget. You know, nobody in the White House is going to have a budget. And when you interact within the interagency, 
you need a budget and and the the times that i um that i saw very small useful contributions that acta made it was because we had money to spend and could spend it faster than the state department or the department of energy so for example when we wanted to see if water sampling in Iraq back in the 1990s could detect radio uh, nuclides. We were able to put the money together and the Department of Energy was like, okay, yeah, sure, you pay our contractors. <laughs> you know, so that's a very practical uh, value that a small kind of agile agency um, could add. Overall, so kind of what I'm hearing in our conversation among the panelists is that no it's not uh it's not possible to really make a big dent in arms control and disarmament by establishing a new agency but it, if it reflected a, a a new commitment to whatever you want to call it arms control or threat reduction technology threat reduction um that could that could make a, a difference um, does anyone on the panel want to comment now? I see a uh, Rose, you have your hand up. And then we have quite a few really good questions to go through from the participants. Rose, do you want to jump in? Yeah, I just had a question for Jim too about the notion of a special assistant to the president uh, for arms control and disarmament. You mentioned that that person would interact regularly with Capitol Hill, but that's not usually the function of uh, somebody in the White House. They normally avoid going to Capitol Hill. So how do, you, how do you think about that aspect of it? Because I do agree with Amy that it's so important uh, to try to do everything we can to engage uh, both staff and members on Capitol Hill to, to try to get them more focused on these issues, but it's, it's a very heavy lift. So how are you thinking about that aspect of it? Well, I'm thinking that the president would give a special authorization to the special assistant for arms control or whatever you want to call it. Threat reduction is a good term. Uh, that was the case during the Eisenhower administration. The president gave Harold Stassen the authority to convene interagency meetings. And so Stassen required each agency to have a senior representative who would come to meetings uh, and an assistant to the special representative, and that's how I got involved in arms control. I was an assistant uh, to Johnny von Neumann uh, at the, arms at the uh, Atomic Energy Commission, and that was a very fine beginning. Uh, the agency actually, uh, arms control agency could do the same thing uh, if it's located just as a special assistant to the president uh, kind of uh, position. Uh, and I don't see any problem in the president authorizing his special assistant uh, to uh, be at the uh, call of Congress to give a testimony to the uh, Foreign Affairs Committee, Armed Services Committee, and so forth. So uh, it seems to me a lot could be done uh, that way if the president uh, wanted it done and uh, all, all legal, so far as I can see. So I guess I would like to, we, we have several really good questions uh, in the, in the Q&A section here. Um, some of them are substantive on arms control. I'm going to put those, you know, like how do we incentivize China on INF? I'm going to put those two um, to the side uh, just for a moment and focus on kind of the more organizational questions. Um, and I'm going to kind of summarize them in case our panelists have not um, had a chance to read them. Um, we had a really interesting one from Aaron Dumbacher, which is, you know, there's talk about um, restructuring, uh, addressing cyber and emerging technology issues at state. Um, you know, how would you organize to do that? That's a very rough translation of that question. Um, another one from Paul Meyer, uh, Ambassador Meyer, uh, who says, you know, how, how is arms control in the face of so much money on the weapons side, right? Uh, how do we make progress? So I guess that's a broader question um, about, you know, how do we 
institutionalize, can we institutionalize progress um, on arms control? And then one more, uh, there was a question about uh, very at the very top of the hour uh, about establishing a research institute for arms control of missiles. So panelists, who'd like to start? Rose, go ahead. <laughs> Yeah, thank you very much. I liked uh, Aaron's question a lot. Uh, there is discussion of, uh, of a bureau that is more focused on emerging technologies and their implications uh, for uh, US, uh, well, US national security policy clearly, but also uh, thinking through where they would best fit into diplomatic structures in order to make the greatest uh, the greatest progress on national security issues that, that we care about. I'm actually uh, supportive, I guess that probably won't <laughs> surprise people. I'm actually supportive of the notion of creating a new bureau in the T family uh, that would uh, be focused on uh, emerging technologies and how we are to address them uh, going forward with uh, absolutely uh, good links around the interagency to the other entities, each uh, each department is trying to grapple with this issue of how best to organize for, uh, for the challenges that are represented, but also the opportunities of new and emerging technologies. I like the thought of putting them into uh, the T family because precisely it would enable us also to think about uh, both the challenges, how do we address uh, some of the necessity of, of having, uh, again, negotiated restraint in this area. That's what I'm thinking about. Uh, we're not going to be able to put blanket constraints on artificial intelligence, which Bob Gallucci brought up as a concern with regard to, uh, with regard to nuclear command and control, but can we come to some agreements and can we think through how we might actually uh, agree that uh, AI technology should not be applied, dead hand kind of techniques should not be applied to nuclear command and control and then come up with some uh, agreed measures to uh, at least have some uh, assurance or predictability that others are, are living up to that. So that's just an example of a challenge that we have to confront, but there are also opportunities in the new technologies. And I uh, think uh, that in terms of how we monitor uh, treaties and agreements in the future, and not only arms control treaties, but uh, environmental treaties and other kinds of treaties, the new op opportunities that are emerging because of ubiquitous sensing capabilities that produce a lot of data, which can now be tackled through big data analysis, and their AI techniques are quite useful and, and could be quite positive. So having a bureau in, in the State Department, I would argue in the T family that could look at both those challenges and opportunities of emerging technology is important. And I hope this issue will uh, move forward to being settled soon. Thank you, David, just one second. I think Bob, Bob needs to go and teach a class. So if any final words from you, you did have a very pointed question from Ed Levine, but you can always email him <laughs> if you need to. No, you're good, you're muted. <laughs> All right, we'll, we'll go to David Coplow. Um, I, I wanted to speak briefly to the importance of organizational structure, whether it's creating a new box and a wiring diagram for cyber within the Department of State, or whether it's creating a new entity like the Space Force or a new Arms Control and Disarmament Agency. And here I'm inspired by Bob's earlier baseball references, um, which I think are always in order. Uh, and I want to borrow the line, if you build it, they will come. Uh, if there were a new ACTA, it would generate some of its own business uh, in support of these uh, enterprises. If there were a new ACTA, there would be people testifying and briefing on Capitol Hill all the time, helping to make it somewhat more regularized and systematic rather than episodic. And I agree with Amy that that's absolutely crucial in restoring the prominence of this issue. Similarly, there would be people from that agency who are fanning out across the country to give speeches 
to the Rotary Club in Dallas and the Council on Foreign Relations in Chicago. Uh, and that too would elevate the importance of this issue in the public mind, uh, at least the elite public mind. And, and that makes a difference. Uh, in fact, in thinking about the advocacy for a new ACTA, I found myself singing from an unfamiliar hymnal, and that is the advocacy for the Space Force. I'm not particularly a, a big fan of the Space Force, but it is noteworthy that within a very short period of time, that idea went from a very small cadre of people who are championing it, and most people sort of thinking of it more as a joke than a serious enterprise, and it suddenly worked. And some of the arguments that were adduced in favor of that resonate with some of the arguments in favor of an ACTA, that is making the symbolic statement that this is an, an issue of big and increasing importance making the point that it's valuable to have an entity led by people who are thinking about this topic all the time and who are the, the go-to point for any issue of this sort and making the point that it's valuable to sustain a career track for people who wanna specialize in this. I'm not saying this is easy. I'm not saying that there's currently political support with it, for it within the Congress. I'm just saying it'd be a good idea to have it done. I think I would add one more point before turning to Amy that many of the folks on the line here may may be aware of. But um, you know, in some respects, since since ACTA um, was abolished, there there's been a push, um, you know, in the private sector. So there's a, a actually, I guess it's a public private partnership, the International Partnership for Nuclear Disarmament Verification. Um, sorry, those are my dogs. Um, but um, but some of that private funding is is going away with the MacArthur Foundation, which is a, has been a huge source of funding for that. And so I would say that that truly does argue for some focal point in the US government um, beyond the arms ACV, the Arms Control and Verification Bureau at state um, to, to get some money behind it to support capacity building in people and technology and analysis. Sorry for the dogs. Amy, over to you. Don't want to gloat, but it was your dogs, not mine. Um, mine's still standing here waiting to be petted. But anyway, I wanted to comment a little bit on how to get Congress engaged or whether Congress can get engaged. And I'm gonna focus on the words because when I looked at Aaron's um, question in the Q&A section, my eyes glazed over. Advanced technologies, emerging technologies, all the stuff that everybody is thinking about as being a game changer for efforts to control weapons and arms control, all the words, it's beyond me. I don't understand those things well enough to have a conversation on them, but I do know what the word arms control does when you bring it into a conversation, whether it's in a think tank meeting or on Capitol Hill, you immediately get a polarization in the room. People either like arms control or they don't like arms control. Either they see it as a pathway to disarmament or they see it as a gift we give to other nations. They don't see it as a tool for national security to mitigate risks. And from Aaron's question, from other things that people on the panel have talked about, that's what we're talking about here is tools and capabilities to manage risks to national security in ways that aren't in the buying weapons side or the pure diplomacy side. But calling it arms control or arms control and disarmament, which is also not a good word to use in public fora these days, it, it, it automatically characterizes the conversation. So maybe an organizational change is appropriate to elevate the issue and provide career paths and provide briefers for member of Congress. But if they walk into the room saying, I'm from the arms control agency and I'm here to solve your problem, they're going to be able to turn around and leave. So if we're thinking about the threats we're addressing, the risks we're trying to mitigate, the objectives of creating a new agency, 
something I've been suggesting for years, we need to find a phrase that's not arms control to describe what it is that they do. If we're trying to engage the new technologies and the emerging consensus on what the risks are that we need to address. That is a fabulous point. We should call it technology risk reduction or you know, like something let we, we this panel this panel has so much intellectual firepower let's come up with a name right now that would be you know i've been calling it risk mitigation or cooperative risk mitigation but it's not catching on and i've been trying this for two or three i think years. you need technology in there ambassador could be do you have an idea well, there has been something already called the Threat Reduction Agency housed in the Department of State, and I don't think it exists anymore. Maybe I'm wrong, but it should be uh, recreated and with a larger mandate and perhaps uh, put somewhere else other than in the Department of Defense. So what's wrong with that? Well, in addition, did you mean in addition to the, def I mean, there's the Defense Threat Reduction Agency. And I think, I believe in your article, you mentioned bringing some of those assets into a broader threat reduction agency. Am I correct? That's correct. That's what he had in mind, right. And then the Nun Lugar program was originally called CTR. Right, yeah. And Jim had the idea, and, and then housed within the Defense Threat Reduction Agency. And Jim had the good idea in our article to call the new agency, the Cooperative Threat Reduction Agency. I'm, I'm not so focused on the name as long as it has the mandate and the horsepower to do the job. But I think in the world of social media nowadays, we need a good name and a good Twitter handle, maybe even a TikTok dance. <laughs> Listen, if, if I could get the substance, I'd call the darn thing the Kardashian agency. Uh, the, the name wouldn't matter so much. That was not quite my point, Sharon. <laughs> my point was, if you walk in and say arms control, the room splits in two and you don't have much of a conversation. That's very, very true. And uh, part of my thinking about how to, how to look to the future, uh, it really is about how are we going to, as I think about it, continue to address uh, these emerging threats at the negotiating table, not just depend on military tools to do so. So that's, that's the basics. But there are just so many, um, I would say, uh, skeletons in the closet that we're dealing with. I was just laughing to myself about the Office of Technology Assessment, which you know also on the congressional side also came in for a big bazooka shot at some point and, and was gotten rid of. So uh, there's lots of skeletons in the closet when you're trying to, to address these issues. But I very carefully, I, uh, I quickly wanted to give a shout out to Bill Moon who asked a good question. And he is one of the uh, former leaders now retired of, uh, of the CTR work that was done on warheads uh, during that period in the Defense Threat Reduction Agency over in uh, the Defense Department. And I have to say, from my experience working those issues in DOE and NSA, and prior to NNSA's establishment, there were times when DOE and, and, and defense didn't know what each other was doing in this space and were tripping over each other, but eventually they got it uh, down so that there was better coordination and a better, uh, a better division of labor. So it is possible that even inside an existing interagency structure, agencies can improve their overall behavior in terms of mitigating risks and, and addressing threats. Uh, Bill asked, uh, should we do a standing uh, committee uh, between or a standing commission between Russia and the United States to address these kinds of issues? My answer to that would be a, a big yes, but only if the interagencies in both Moscow and Washington were committed to continuing uh, to uh, support such an effort and do so with a high level uh, authorization as well, because otherwise uh, they'll just be wandering in the wilderness. You've got to have that high level authorization. You've got to have the interagencies in both capitals putting the resources into the effort, but it would solve the problem we're seeing today of talk about episodic engagement here in Washington, episodic engagement on a bilateral basis. Mm -hmm. So we have many more questions. I'm not sure we can answer them all, for which I apologize to the folks who have 
ask them. But uh, I'm certainly, you know, like if you'd like to email me uh, the question, and I can always uh, see if one or more of our uh, speakers can answer them. I would like to just comment on one really intriguing uh, question, which was, what did we learn, if any, from the deadly COVID-19 management, and how would we apply that to arms control? So very, um, on you know, 30,000 foot level, um, preparation. <laughs> is key. And I don't think that you can go into any arms control, and this goes back to capacity building, right? Um, it's really hard to enter into an arms control negotiation without having a lot of background, without having a lot of technical data. That resides in people uh, largely. Um, and when I joined the Arms Control and Disarmament Agency in 1992, I was able to draw on the expertise of people who had done this work for decades. I'm not sure if that's there anymore. Um, I know that isn't totally a question about COVID-19, but, um, um, but it does speak to how you manage risks and how you put capabilities into place uh, so that you're not completely surprised. Um, we have about three minutes left. Are, do any of the panelists wish to address any of the specific questions that were asked. We did have one very specifically on CTBT ratification um, uh, and others on, not quite sure, the role of the UN. Quick answer to whether CTBT would be ratified if that's a question for, will the Senate vote yes? The answer is no. No, I think the question was, uh, you know, who would <laughs> who would bring this uh, treaty to uh, <laughs> who would bring the treaty to the Senate? It won't go, it won't be brought up uh, to the Senate unless the the numbers were absolutely positive. I mean, there's um, I always think back to that movie Fatal Attraction where <laughs> where Glenn Close rises up. You think she's dead, you know, three times and she keeps rising up. Um, you know, but. The CTBT is an interesting, um, you know, final point on all of this, right? We have a CTBT organization, even though the treaty has not entered into force. And I would say the fact that you had an organization and an exec, uh, I forget exactly what, well, Rob, Flo he's an executive secretary, but not quite, right? Because it's an interim thing. Um, to advocate for nuclear testing moratorium, there's a monitoring system in place. That has been a huge help to sustaining the norm of not testing North Korea notwithstanding for many, many years. And it goes back to the point of that, I think it was Rufus Miles came up with that saying, you know, where you stand depends on where you sit. When you create an organization where people have a vested interest and they have a single, you know, focus, of what they're going to do, you create, you create some, you know, political and bureaucratic momentum. So, um, unless my panelists have uh, anything further to say, what I would, what I would like to say is, thank you so much. This has been really fascinating. We could probably spend an entire week on this topic, but um, I'm so grateful to all of you for uh, offering your expertise and your wisdom. And um, I think we had a really lively, uh, not one-sided discussion. So um, with that, thank you very, very much. And I hope you'll be able to join us for the next nuclear policy talks. Thanks to our audience also. Take care.